Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology, and I'm doing a presentation today for Nadia's YouTube channel. I hope that all of you will really enjoy this. Um, I'm really uh, honored to have the uh, privilege to do something for you guys. And Nadia invited me to um, make a presentation for her channel last year, and I had a really fun time doing that. I think I did something on the houses. And um, this year I got a little something different, but I'm, I'm just, first of all, just really happy to be back. And I hope that you all get something good out of this. Nadia is an awesome astrologer and um, yeah, just uh, anyone that is really vibing on Nadia's work, um, I'm sure that uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this as, as well. Um, Nadia and I, I think, have a lot of the same interests and same values when it comes to astrology. So um, yeah, just really happy to be back and doing something again for Nadia. Um, all right, so the talk that I'm doing today for you guys is a talk that I've given at a few astrology conferences in the past year, and um, it's been a really fun talk to present. And the name of the talk is, What Do Astrologers Really Believe? And the reason that I'm calling it this is because as an astrologer, I find that it's sometimes the most challenging question to answer. I'll get this question from people you know, maybe when I'm at a social function of social gathering of some kind, or um, oftentimes even, you know, at family gatherings, or I haven't seen people in a while. And they're like, so exactly, you know, what do you do? And I'm you know, kind of explaining what astrology is, is challenging enough. But um, oftentimes, the deepest question that I get that I find like, I don't have, <laughs> there's no like, two minute elevator speech type of answer for is so what do astrologers believe? Is it a religion? you know, is there something I have to believe to do astrology? Is it okay that I'm like maybe a Christian? Could I get into astrology if I'm a Muslim or, you know what I mean? Like, so people really um, don't always know what astrologers actually believe. Okay. So you're predicting the future. Maybe that's a bad thing. Like maybe I shouldn't know about the future, right? Why would you do that? Or you're looking at uh, a person's psychology by the stars. So what, what good is that? Like, what do you use that for? Or why do you do that? Um, now, of course, there are a lot of answers to these questions that are given by astrologers over thousands of years now. And so today, what I want to try to present for you is not so much a, um, uh, a definitive answer to this question of what do astrologers believe, but I want to give everyone who just enjoys astrology some sense of what the earliest astrologers believed in both the East, like mm. in India and Indian astrology, and in the West, in say Western astrology. Um, they're both Eastern and Western astrology both share, share m many more similarities than they do differences. We use the same 12 signs, we use the planets, we use aspects the same way, the same meanings of the houses are basically there. So, but, and, but what people don't always know is that so many of the philosophical beliefs of the earliest astrologers in India are also very similar to those beliefs that astrologers in the Greco-Roman world shared. Um, so today the idea is to pre present you with a kind of cross-cultural um, and uh, ancient understanding of the um, beliefs of astrologers. And the hope in doing this is also so that you might, um, if you're someone like me who sometimes struggles to articulate or explain like what do astrologers believe, this hopefully this presentation will be helpful for you. Um, it may help you to formulate your own, say, belief statements or faith statements or something like that. Um, there's a few things that, um, you know, uh, that we could kind of through this talk that you could kind of come away with saying, yeah, these are some of the basic things that I believe as an astrologer. And it turns out that astrologers have believed for thousands of years. And if not, if you're not someone who's looking to clarify your spiritual beliefs or understand why you do astrology, if you're like, I just do it for fun, I don't need some elaborate, then this can be a talk that is um, philosophically and historically informative. You can just learn a little bit about what the earliest astrologers believed about reality and the universe and the soul and divinity and karma and all these different interesting concepts. So the way that I'm gonna present this is I'm going to present to you the parallel ideas that were popular in both Eastern astrology and Western astrology at the dawn of horoscopic astrology and its, and its birth in the world, when birth charts were first being cast in the way that you and I are familiar with over 2000 years ago, 
What did they believe? What were the beliefs? So that's what we're going to look at. Okay. Um, now I'm going to put a presentation up on the screen. <clears throat> Here we go. And uh, let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay. So the first basic thing that astrologers in both the East and the West agreed upon was the notion of an ordered cosmos. So for example, the Greeks had a concept that they called harmonia. And this was a concept that was pervasive as early as the last thousand years BCE. That's if you just to put it in context, astrology emerges in like the last 500 years BCE. So um, this concept of harmonia dates back all the way to, you know, well before that. We have, um, for example, the poet Hesiod in the, in the Greek world as early as 700 BCE talking about harmonia in his famous poetic work, The Theogony. Another major uh, philosopher who talks about harmonia a lot is Heraclitus. He is someone, if you've ever heard the, the quote about you can't step in the same river twice. Um, so Heraclitus defined harmonia like this. He said that harmonia was an eternal cosmological principle whereby opposites in the material world were joined together in a proper relationship with each other. So he also famously connected um, uh, uh, character and fate together, which ends up becoming uh, an, an integral part of astrology later. The Pythagoreans, which were another very important philosophical school that had a huge influence on the founders of astrology, also thought of harmonia as a force governing the orderly fitting together of sound, and that the good of the human soul consisted in grasping and assimilating to that order. So you can almost think about it like um, the human body, the human soul is like an instrument. And the, the cosmos is ringing with this beautiful music. And the idea is that we're trying to tune our soul to, um, you know, be in harmony with the music of the spheres. This is an idea that um, predates astrology, but of course is hugely, hugely informs the philosophical foundation of astrology that the cosmos is harmonious and that we can be in harmony with it. And astrology is a part of that study. So similarly, we see Plato and many other Greek philosophers envisioning a, co envisioning a cosmos that's ordered uh, and harmonious. It's good, it's beautiful, it's true, and it's just in, in the way that it's designed. Um, and so, and for almost all Greek philosophers, uh, this order involved both the elements like fire, earth, air, water, ether, and also the heavenly bodies, the planets that their order in nature reflected a larger uh, divine intelligence that was at work, almost like an early version of the intelligent design theory. Um, now, for Indian philosophers, as early as the Rig Veda, uh, which goes, you know, scholars, you know, kind of Western scholars will date to 1500 to 1200 BCE, somewhere in there. So really old, but some say even much older than that. There was a concept called Ritta, and it's used to denote similar a similar idea. The Rig Veda actually, which is one of the if oldest, if, if not one of the oldest um, uh, spiritual texts on the planet, or maybe any text on the planet, it's, it's very, very old. And it contains over 400 instances of the noun Ritta. Well, this word as an adjective means um, ordered, right, righteous, um, efficient, correct, orderly, um, but it also was used um, in relation to the ordering of a religious or spiritual ceremony, like in, you know, Native American shamanism, you might see the calling of the four directions. So it has a sense of being the order that keeps sacredness in re religious ceremony, but also in the larger cosmos. And it's associated with the image of a path, <clears throat> a great wheel or river in the sky. And um, the Rig Veda also tells us that the sphere of being, life, and truth is regulated by Ritta, very similar to what the Pythagoreans said, that the universe is sort of this harmonious musical orchestration. And um, Indian philosophers said that uh, Sat, which is the realm of being and, and truth, you could say, is also related in the Vedas to Ritta. 
And both are opposed to asat or non-being and untruth and anritta or that which lacks meaningful order. So again, there's a sense of order that's there, but also the potential to sort of deviate from that, like our instruments can kind of come out of tune. And so um, one of the most likely philosophical beliefs of the earliest astrologers, if we look at the pervasiveness of these ideas in both the East and the West, is that they believe that the cosmos was beautifully ordered, just, true, and good. And that they saw the cosmos as this beautifully designed tapestry reflecting divine intelligence. And that astrology was a part of, it was a spiritual study. It wasn't just something that you did to learn about the future. It wasn't even something you did to like just understand your own personality profile. It was something even deeper than that. It was about learning to be in tune with the larger harmony of creation. And um, so this is probably one of the simplest things we could say that still today as astrologers, many of us value or embrace. We embrace this idea that the universe is an ordered, meaningful place, but we also have to stay in tune with it. And for many of us, that's exactly what astrology does. Now, are people going to laugh at you if you say that? Maybe, right? But it, it helps as we're going to clarify our beliefs. So we're just like, well, you know, what do astrologers believe? Well, this is the simplest starting place. So, all right, let's go on. There's also a philosophical um, area that ancient astrologers um, uh, were all concerned about because the philosophical climate of the time was concerned with, not just at the birth of astrology, but well before the birth of astrology. And this is, we could say the problem of the one versus the many, or we could say just the um, uh, looking for the, the union or the relationship between the one and the many. So let's try to explain this. Um, in ancient times, in many places in the ancient world, you have the recognition of something that's transcendent, that's beyond all of this, right? That, that's beyond the heavens even. And then you also have the idea of, all of this, which is a world of many diverse forms, right? You have plants and animals and elements and people and stars and right. So, um, and then there's also some sense that even though there's many things that are different, that they're all still a part of one thing, just like there's lots of different parts of my body, but it's all still part of one being. So the one and the many, and how are these things reconciled? So as early as like the 16th century BCE, well before the dawn of astrology, Egypt began embracing the idea of a transcendental source or, or all unifying God, um, Amun-Re, who would include, includes everything, but also transcends everything. So you have simultaneous imminence, the presence of the sacred here in the world of diverse forms. And then you also have an idea of transcendence, something that goes beyond. So there's Egypt long ago, right? How about Mesopotamia? Mesopotamian mythology and theology, the notion of a single anthropomorphic and transcendent being whose body parts are the various imminent aspects of the universe, the stars, the planets, the trees, they're all body parts of this divine being. Um, that the divine being is bigger than all the parts, bigger than the sum of its parts, but also all everything in this world could be seen as part of it. That's popular by as early as 2000 BCE, right? So these are the two seedbeds of astrology, Egypt, Babylon, Mesopotamia. And this is the issue that they're dealing with, transcendence and imminence, the one, the many, uh, unity, diversity. In the Rig Veda, similarly in India, the universe is described as a giant body, the body of God, uh, which is both imminent and also transcendent at once, same thing. And in Greece, you have the Orphics in the 5th and 6th century BCE, Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, Xenophanes, Parmenides, um, and Plato, all dealing with the same issue. How is it that there is one overall thing but its parts are many? Or how is there something transcendent and something imminent? How is there something diverse, but something unified? And they're thinking about this. They're, they're thinking about the differences and as well as the unity. And they're just noticing this as a basic property of reality, that there's unity and there's difference. And they're thinking about it in terms of ultimate reality. What is ultimate truth? What is ultimately real? 
So although there were many different schools of, of thought, there was broad agreement about several fundamental issues. The material world that we live in is governed by impermanence, flux, and change. So all of these diverse forms like plants and people and rivers and weather patterns, that they are always coming into being and then going out of being. Like someday I was born, my body came into being, and then my body will go out of being. And the material world is this full of like diversity and flux. However, they also believe that underlying or within all of these seeming changes, all impermanence was a single spiritual source, essence, eternal principle or being, um, the knowledge of which is of the utmost importance because um, it is the goal of the spiritual aspirant <clears throat> to align their individual essence with the greater whole again. So that's going back to this idea of harmonia or ritta. But again, you can see where first we're starting with this idea of, of harmony in the cosmos, but then we're moving into a more nuanced understanding of harmony, which is that, there is diversity and there's also unity in that diversity. Um, there is a sense in which the material world is impermanent and everything is changing, coming into being and going out of being. And yet there is a single all pervasive undying and unborn essence. So this also becomes a basic belief, which we might find value from today as well. Um, ancient astrologers in both the East and the West believed in the one and the many, transcendence and imminence, in a world of flux, impermanence, time and change, as well as eternality, timelessness, and changeless being. So then it gets even more personal from there, right? Now we're going into the reality of divinity and uh, the, the issue of the one and the many when it comes down to the level of, of human beings and our everyday human life. <clears throat> So, for example, the Orphics, a, a school of philosophers who were very important to the development of astrology, as were the Pythagoreans and the Platonists and many other Greek philosophers, along with the Vedas in the East, a tradition of spiritual literature and the Upanishads, which are sort of philosophical commentaries on the Vedas, they move from the more, <clears throat> excuse me, abstract philosophical problem of the one and the many to the implications of this problem for human life. So that's where, you know, you and I and astrology starts making a lot more sense because like, for example, in the Indian tradition of the Vedas and especially the Upanishads, it said that what we need is knowledge of our true self or our soul. Each of us have an individual essence called an, what you might be called an, an Atman. And it's a part of, the larger cosmic self, you could say, which is like the Brahman. So it's necessary in order, in order not to get caught up in the illusion that you are nothing more than your material form, which comes into being and then eventually dies, um, in order to not be identified with the illusion that that's all you are, you have to strive to identify with your higher self, with your true self, the Atman. And you have to see the Atman as something that's trying to vibrate or be filled with the resonance of Brahman, the, the larger whole of which you are a part. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which many people know through like modern yoga teacher training programs, which teach us how to develop sort of single pointed meditative focus um, and uh, enter into samadhi. This is, this is merging our uh, Atman into the Brahman, this process of yoga. This flowers from these ideas. This is like the instructions of, okay, so then go and do yoga in order to uh, awaken the higher self and eventually, you know, maybe blast out the crown chakra and, and you know, head into the, to the Brahma Jyoti or whatever, head into the merge back into the spiritual essence. These are different ideas that existed, of course. The Orphics similarly believed that release from my material identification is obtained through recalling or recollection of one's higher spiritual nature. Plato similarly compared the journey of the philosopher as one from ignorance within the realm of trivial opinions about stuff in the world that's all just going to, it's all impermanent anyway to knowledge or recollection of the eternal archetypal forms. Uh, 
So when we're doing astrology from this perspective, what we're really doing is creating a kind of um, a prayer with our life. Our life becomes a kind of moving meditation when we are reflecting upon our life in terms of these un, unborn and undying sort of patterns, right? Like if you if you are, you know, having a really bad day, right? And then you understand that, say, Mercury is retrograde and you missed your flight or something like that. It's never, I don't mean to hate on Mercury retrogrades, but, you know, sometimes it happens. So you miss your flight and you're like, hey, you know, the astrology uh, told me that this was going to happen or that the astrology reflects the happening of having missed your flight. And suddenly instead of being stuck on the feelings, the bad feelings of like, oh, I missed my flight. And then now I have to be mad because I'm, I see I'm caught up in the material element of the story. But the uh, reflection upon the Mercury retrograde takes us into this uh, deeper contemplation of the, the higher patterns, uh, the, the higher fl flux and flow of life. And that for Plato is part of what takes us, starts taking us into uh, our, our mind occupied with contemplation of higher things. We start to lift into that higher self. So many of us, astrology works like this. Astrology is, is a way that we have of learning to see ourselves in relation to the, the uh, organizing patterns of reality. And that, that's, uh, uh, and those patterns are unborn and undying, right? Sort of like, um, you know, the, you know, the, the image of like stealing something or the image of, um, you know, courage or the image of romance. Any, any, like th these, uh, these are archetypal experiences and although they, there are many, many and uncountable specific instances of them, they also exist in this kind of ideal way. And so when we learn to reflect on our life in that way, we start to recognize, hey, you know, this is a pretty, um, this is like a Shakespearean drama. It has a certain reality to it, but also I don't have to be so identified with it that I'm lost in it. So, um, Plato specifically says that this journey of contemplation of the higher forms and higher truth will not be taken by many people due to the tendency of the soul to be identified with the flickering realm of appearances and shadows. It's much easier to stay stuck in, you know, gossip columns and uh, the daily news cycle and all of the daily stresses and traumas, right? But to actually start reflecting upon these movements as though we, we can see them as the, just the, the workings of an endless, you know, uh, performance, an endless play. Um, that takes a, a, a certain kind of disengagement with the world. And for some people, you know, it's really scary. And so, um, and understandably, we have a vested interest in this world. We still have to be here too. But it's this kind of um, contemplation of higher things that's present in both the East and the West. And it's necessary so that we don't get overly identified with the body. Because if all we are is the body, uh, then um, we're missing the eternal spiritual being that we actually are from this perspective. So the Stoics had very similar beliefs. They believed um, that there were different opposing substances, matter and reason, both of which comprised God. And the human soul was said to be part of the eternal substance of reason or mind <clears throat> and could find happiness by identifying with it rather than the passive substance of matter, which is just the fleeting, you know, realm of appetites and hungers and digestion and sleep and wake and like, and again, leads to death eventually. So for the Stoics, the way to embrace the, um, the divine element of, of our being was to stay in the moment, stay in the moment. Don't get lost in the past. Don't get lost in the future. And you, you're accepting of everything that is in the moment as it comes to pass. And you'd be very careful to not let desires and fears drive you. So these are all philosophical schools that were popular either just preceding the dawn of Hellenistic astrology and Indian astrology uh, or during the early practice of uh, astrology. So what can we take from this? Well, ancient astrologers in both the East and the West believed in the reality of the soul and of divinity. 
the the lower the sort of self and a a, a larger greater self. And astrologers believe that materially embodied souls, people who are in material forms, beings that are in material forms, whether they're plants or animals or people, that we tend to struggle due to the complications of being of two natures simultaneously. Like we're eternal, unborn, undying beings, and yet we're in a body that dies. That's a little complicated, right? So, so the idea is that all ancient astrologers likely most likely believed, I mean, it's, it's beyond most likely, they did believe in the reality of the soul and of um, the soul's unborn, undying nature and of the need to awaken that even as we're in a body that will die. So that becomes a critical part of why we practice astrology because astrology helps us remember that we're spiritual beings. And, in, and unless we do that, we tend to, we, we suffer so so much in this world uh, without that orientation. It's like a compass helping us guide us through this journey. Okay. So the next one that's really big is, um, you know, and this is the ju- gets a little juicier, gets a little bit closer to our, our uh, practice of astrology is reincarnation and karma. So basically astrologers, you could say, although the language is different in both the East and the West are um, recognizing that the soul is transmigrating from one body and one form to the next in this material universe that the journey, um, the journey doesn't, didn't begin with this body that we're in now that it has um, actually in, in the East, the word that's used to describe how long we've been here transmigrating from one form to the next is a naughty, which means beginningless. It, it's uh, it's like, if, it's like if you had a fishbowl and the fish were just swimming in the fishbowl and they had always been doing it. They had always been there doing it, but they just took on different forms. You know what I mean? Like just think of a really big fish tank or something. It's like everything's been swimming around here, coming and going, coming into being and going out of being. Galaxies have been coming into being and going out of being. Universes upon universes material universes have been coming into being and going out of being and endless beings are fluctuating from one form to the next. And this has just always been happening. And so um, <clears throat> we are transmigrating from one experience to the next. However, common to both astrologers in the East and the West is also this idea that um, we, we can leave this realm and join with our, the essential spiritual nature that we are. So we can, rather than having to constantly recycle through all different kinds of forms where the experiences within those forms, not only is there impermanence and death to deal with, but there's also the extremes of all different kinds of dualities, heaven and hell, good and evil, right? And those are these, these binaries that the world, the material world is sort of defined by and we're constantly going through as we take form. And ancient astrologers in both the East and the West were like, and that, that experience, the soul eventually starts to wonder, is there something else? Maybe there's something other than having to recycle through all these different forms and go through all of these polarizing dichotomies, good, evil, et cetera. Uh, so this is getting a little bit more esoteric. Um, but, uh, for example, Indian and Greek, um, philosophers alike believed in the process of reincarnation called samsara in the East, metempsychosis in the West. There were also moral and psychological laws governing the process of reincarnation of what shapes and shifts one taking of one form to the next. That was called karma in the East, catharsis in the West. And also the goal of escape from that recycling process, joining with our true spiritual nature in a heavenly realm or merging with God or lots of different ideas about it, but called moksha in the East, liberation or lucis in the West, which is like enlightenment. So Plato in the West suggested that the process of catharsis or purification through successive reincarnations would also... um, you could also be seen basically by um, taking better births and a better birth is defined in both the East and the West, at least in part in terms of the um, circumstances of your life leading you to the association with other spiritual people, spiritual teachers, 
the pursuit of knowledge and truth and spiritual life. So it's not as though a better birth is defined in a superficial way either. A better birth would be one that's conducive to you continuing to develop your spiritual, uh, your pursuit of spiritual awakening. And um, so sometimes people in terrible material circumstances, it's exactly those circumstances that allows them to pick right back up with the necessity of spiritual life. Sometimes really opulent material circumstances are not going to keep you interested in spiritual things. Why would you? You don't have to worry about anything. You can stay comfy in the illusion of that material life is all that there is, right? On the other hand, sometimes having a lot of opulence and wealth may be conducive to a spirit soul who wants to travel, wants to see the world, needs, you know, needs a family background and education and support that's going to help that. Other times, it's, you know, the suffering is reflective of people who have who have uh, someone born into a lot of suffering. Sometimes it's a karmic thing because a person is receiving the reactions of previous, you know, sins, so to speak, just being a selfish person or whatever. And so sometimes it works like that, but other times um, when we suffer in any way, it can also be specifically conducive to waking us up. For example, have you ever lost someone or something that you've loved? Think about how illuminating that can be, how clarifying it can be, and what a gift it really is to suffer sometimes. So this is not a, even in ancient times, an understanding of what it would mean to take better births as you're going along, and the moral and psychological rules sort of governing this process are deeply enigmatic. In fact, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that, you know, basically tells Arjuna, he's, he's, he's having this long conversation with on this battlefield, and Krishna's uh, like an incarnation of God, and Krishna says, you know, this is um, not something you're going to understand. It, the, the rules of, of karma are not, like even the wisest sages don't understand what they are. So, um, but you do also have uh, some sense of there being uh, moral uh, reactions, that there's a, a justice system at work in the universe. Um, the Chandogya Upanishad said, those whose conduct has been good will quickly attain a good birth. And in the Phaedo, Plato says, those who have cultivated gluttony or selfishness or drunkenness are likely to assume the form of donkeys, right? So you get the feeling, not that I, you know, I don't know how much Plato knew about this, how much he was speculating, right? But you have the idea that there is some kind of morality behind this. You also have two different levels of karma that seem to be talked about at times, which is on the one hand, a karma that has to do with pious credits, so it's kind of like, yeah, do good things, think good thoughts, get good stuff, right? Um, and then there's another, but then there's another form that says, it doesn't matter how much good stuff you do or how good of a person you are. Yes, you'll get your just reward, but eventually it will run out, right? And and then you'll receive, you'll start to receive the opposite, like. Once your cup is full, it will eventually be emptied. So there's another kind of teaching that runs along the, the same lines. It says, you know, people, are re are, people are getting good births in some ways in terms of materialistic desires that they have because they act and behave in a good way, almost like the modern version of the secret, like think positive thoughts and you'll get good stuff. And that's real too. There's like people doing that kind of thing. But there's also this deeper instruction that says, until you start inquiring about the absolute truth, and it's still you, until you start desiring basically um, a higher um, a, a, a identification with your higher self, rather than just doing good things and getting good stuff, um, you're going to just keep going around in circles because eventually the good stuff you get through being good runs out and you end up experiencing opposite reactions. So that's something that the Bhagavad Gita is very clear about. And um, uh, you find, you'll find similar kinds of uh, like anecdotes throughout the, the history of ancient philosophy. Now, um, the, where the doctrine of reincarnation comes into ancient Greece is a big debate. There's actually in the Greek world, there are people talking about where this doctrine supposedly comes from. And it's possible that it actually came from India originally or Egypt or Mesopotamia or some other place. Um, but uh, <clears throat> nonetheless, you do see eventually great Greek sages being said to be able to see past lives of other people and even themselves. Like it said that Pythagoras was able to see everything there, that there is in 
10, yes, even 20 human lifetimes. And it was also written of Pythagoras that um, Pythagoras maintains the soul is immortal, next that it changes into other kinds of living things, that events recur in certain cycles, and that nothing is ever absolutely new. And finally, that all living things should be regarded as akin that they're all a part of the same spiritual essence. Pythagoras seems to have been the first to bring these beliefs into Greece. So that's another whole take on the history of this, um, of the philosophy. So Pythagoreans and Orphics also two philosophical groups that were really important prior to the birth of Hellenistic astrology in the West were also closely related on the topic of reincarnation and both seem to be linked to the later dated Hermetic texts as well. So the philosophy of Hermes, who is said to be the legendary founder of astrology, um, he talks about reincarnation as well. And, he, and his philosophy is said to date back to the Egyptians. So you have all of these different schools of thought in the West, though, that are, are definitely interested in the reincarnation of transmigration of the soul and release from that, from that cycle. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so um, you have similar beliefs in in Stoicism, though they're a bit different. Uh, in in also in the East, going all the way farther east in Taoism as well, um, in Buddhism. So this is a, a common idea. So what's again, what's our takeaway from all of this? Well, we can just say that ancient astrologers in both the East and the West believed in the transmigration of the soul of what we might call karma or the shaping of individual births according to the soul's nature, its desires, and its past actions. And of course, a, a, a crucial part of this is also the need or desire on the part of the soul to be free from this cycle. And, the, 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 there, there's, and then there's some distinction between you know, good deeds and the kind of stuff that'll get you and bad deeds and the kind of reactions that might get you. And also this higher spiritual journey where our desires start transcending material stuff. And we start, our motivations start changing from like trying to get good stuff by being a good person to trying to learn about who we really are and, um, and maybe leaving the cycle of rebirth entirely. So, you know, as astrologers today, do we take that on similarly? Maybe that's an open question for some of you. Myself, having been a yoga studio owner for the past 10 years, a yoga teacher and, and being someone who's deeply committed to the path of yoga, um, this this one's a no-brainer for me, right? And it's certainly helpful to know that ancient astrologers, um, you know, believed in these, held these ideas. It's also important to understand that really um, most probable understanding of what a birth chart is, is a reflection of the soul's current leg of the journey, right? It's just telling us this is the karmic field of uh, reactions that you're born into, behaviorally, psychologically, physically, ancestrally, genetically, in terms of heredity, um, in terms of the environment and family you're born into, in terms of all the people that you'll meet and have relationships with. All of this is karma. But there's also, for many of us, the continuation of a spiritual journey. And astrology is also here to help us navigate that field with our free will, meeting fated events with also an open mind and with reflectiveness and using our free will uh, the best that we can, trying to, again, kind of tune our instrument to the larger harmony of the cosmos and trying to inquire about our true spiritual nature. So astrology has been a part of that, both, you know, um, in terms of the people who study it, as well as the people who receive it, say, as sitting down with an astrologer and getting your chart read. Part of the reason that we do astrology is to help us remember the nature of the soul and that we're on this journey and that this is the nature of it. And that it's not all uh, up to us, right? That we, we're, we're very small and insignificant in some ways in the grand scope of the universe. But when we come to understand our place and remember karma and remember the soul, then suddenly our, we, come, we come to remember what our actual free will can be used for, and, and, right? And then we can become really intelligent with our use of it. So astrology is meant to help us with all of this. All right, but here comes the big question, right? It's okay, so liberation and enlightenment. So how does that how does that exactly happen? Because they're uh, uh, you know great. All of this is great. Pretty great, you know some big grand mystical scheme here, right? But practically speaking, we're living human lives. What is what did they what did the ancient astrologers actually say about liberation and enlightenment? How does it happen, or what's the deal there? 
So there's different ways of envisioning how enlightenment happens or what it means or what it is. I'll give you two of the most popular in a nutshell. One is a personal view and one is a more impersonal view. So in the personal view, the, the personal soul, right, is like a spark emanating from a fire or like a sun ray emanating from the sun. We are thought of as like emanations of a divine source. And um, liberation is conceptualized as, you know, the, the cultivation of a loving relationship with that source. You find this in, say, Christianity to a certain extent. Um, and uh, you also find this in uh, one of the largest sects in uh, India, which would be uh, Vaishnavs, who believe in, you know, the, a, a supreme godhead. And uh, the idea is to worship or have a deep intimate relationship between your soul, which is a part of that Godhead, like a ray is to the sun, but is ultimately dependent upon that source. And so having a devotional relationship with that source becomes the paradigm of enlightenment, in which case enlightenment is looked at, for example, in the practice of bhakti, which I practice. Um, in bhakti yoga, we think about cultivating love of God to the to and and the cultivation of love of God is thought of as uh, eventually resulting in uh, release from the cycle of rebirth. And in this sense, uh, love of God, not desiring to get out of the material world or condemning the material world is really the goal. So you find that repeated in different traditions, that version of enlightenment, that there's a soul, that it's never, that the soul is always autonomous, that you're always an individual, but liberation or enlightenment is seen as the soul's um, uh, relationship to its divine source and trying to um, uh, return. You could say it's, it's almost like in this sense, enlightenment is like a, a rock concert in heaven where, you know, everyone's basically hanging out with God in a state of, of ecstasy. Uh, now, another view would be that um, actually everything's just one. There is no, there are no individual souls and there is no separate God that, of which the soul has a relationship with. Everything's just God. And so enlightenment occurs when we release the illusion that we're separate at, in any sense whatsoever, and we merge back into the totality of everything. That's another view. And sometimes it's called a more impersonal view because it's, um, or uh, it, it's sometimes called more non-dual or impersonal, whereas there's no dichotomy between the soul and God. Now, um, of course, these two schools have debates and arguments with each other, right? And those, those two schools in general are very popular in different forms of, of um, yoga. On the other hand, you have a very, some very different views in the West, right? Like um, Buddhists will talk, for example, about um, uh, consciousness itself being extinguished. Because as long as there is consciousness, then there is consciousness of some thing. There has to be consciousness is, is going to have an object of consciousness. So the, the duality, consciousness always implies a duality. So for Buddhists, it's how do you get rid of consciousness in a sense? How do you extinguish it or blow it out? Nirvana. Very different. Plato in the West now. So Plato says that um, basically we need to, we're re trying to regain a state of godhood that we've forgotten. That's somehow our essence, but that we've forgotten it. And this happens through the pursuit of higher truth, um, contemplation of higher things in the mind, and uh, spending time in community with people who are in contemplation of higher things. That This gradually elevates the soul to a higher realm. The Orphics describe a personal afterlife process that the soul would undergo when it died, which could lead to liberation from material bondage and entrance into a spiritual world. The Pythagoreans also envisioned purification of the soul through the study of higher forms, numbers, music, etc., um, and that this could lead to the release from the cycle of rebirth. The Egyptian Book of the Dead had a chapter entitled The Chapter of Not Dying Again, or the Not Dying a Second Time, and liberation is said to happen by the means of the soul finding or using a kind of uh, spiritual ladder that it climbs to heaven by means of after death. These are just a few, right, of the different major philosophical traditions and how they conceptualize either the afterlife, heaven, soul, and God, or a union with God, or uh, liberation, or enlightenment. Now, again, for some of most of us, like 
above my pay grade. You know, you know what I mean? But we need to understand just basically when we're trying to figure out like, what do astrologers really believe? Okay, well, astrologers, ancient astrologers believed in the possibility of liberation or enlightenment of the soul from its delusions, ignorance, or material entanglements. Now, there's also obviously always at this point when I've presented this talk, someone raises their hand and says, this sounds kind of like it's just hating on the material world, right? Like, and as far as I can tell, the material world is actually also a really beautiful place. So why should we hate it so bad? So we have to be aware that in ancient times, um, a couple of things. One, in ancient times, um, there were a variety of schools, some of which were more ascetic and extreme than others, right? So some spiritual traditions have always involved a more harsh or intense rejection of anything material. And most people have probably suffered from someone or a religious tradition that's been like that, just really um, you know, chastise yourself if you ever want, you know, even the slightest desire for a cookie arises, then, you know, just start hitting yourself on the back with a whip, right? And that's like, that's so intense. Um, so you have extremes like that. You have people who starve themselves. You have yogis that sit in caves and don't eat and, you know, learn to, you know, they're, they're like serious, like NASA grade space astronauts over there. <laughs> you know, like, like for, I always say, tell the story, like I had a friend of mine, who was, um, uh, he, he was in India for a year and uh, he was at an ashram and, you know, this is not a joke. People there practice pranayama so intensely that when they're ready to leave their body and blast out the crown chakra later in life and, you know, emerge in Brahman, they'll just do it. So his, and to, to evidence to this, his teacher basically said his goodbyes to everyone one afternoon and that evening, literally died while he was in meditation, pranayama, just upright in lotus. And um, this, is, this is actually a thing. Like it, 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 it does actually exist. And we, you know, if most of us today, we go to meditation class or we go to you know, yoga classes because we're just trying to bring a little sanity into our life, trying to relax, you know, and, and just kind of uh, take it easy and, and just bring our blood pressure down a little bit. And that's good. That's for most of us. That's great, you know. But it's a different thing when you hit hit like you know the the yoga NASA space stations in in some parts of the world like it's a it's a legitimate uh, very intense kind of practice and for many of us that's not where we're going to be at in this lifetime right um, and or maybe and and also it's not necessarily like it's the only way and so there are there are practices uh, that are exist in the ancient world with regard to enlightenment that are sometimes very extreme. And, um, you know, austerities that are really intense as well. We'll talk about those more in a little bit. The other thing we have to, and, and, but then there are those that are not as intense. There have always been uh, traditions like that have been more embracing of or understanding of the material world and seen it as a reflection of divinity. Like if I go for a walk, um, I can, and I look at nature, it can help me reflect upon higher things because the world is a reflection of divine beauty. Uh, at the same time, I could go for a walk and, you know, mug someone, take their money and, you know, maybe even kill someone, right? So this world is treacherous in that the opportunity is there for us to connect with spirit. But um, for many of us, we're caught in a cycle of material ignorance because we think it's all that there is and because we're not interested in connecting with our higher self. So at any rate, long story short is that Yes, in the ancient world, there are a range of uh, different kinds of practices and approaches, even back then, some of them very extreme that you might not like, and some of them that you might find more um, uh, applicable or, or accessible, just as there are today, right? Just as there are today. But the point, the underlying point is still that um, the, the ancient astrologers were not just interested in looking at charts and saying, what's going to happen? Cool. You know, like, what's my personality like? They were interested in using this kind of spiritual technology as part of their pursuit of the elevation of consciousness and of escape from, at the very least, material ignorance, which any of us probably could resonate with. Like, we all would love to be a little less in our lower self and, um, and so astrology was a part of that practice. All right. How about this next one? This is a fun one. Cyclical time. This is, this one gets sort of like mind bendy. Um, 
Greek and Indian thinkers around the dawn of Hellenistic astrology held a belief that time was cyclical. Time runs in cycles and circles. Empedocles, for example, who comes before the dawn of Hellenistic astrology was highly influenced by the Pythagoreans and proposed a system of cyclical time based on quaternity in relation to the four elements. So the first age of the cosmos is an age of love and unity. The second indicates the gradual appearance of strife and division. The third is that of full hate and separation. And then in the fourth, gradually love appears again before reestablishing the first age of love and unity. Sounds like an interesting cycle. Should sound familiar because actually Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist traditions all closely mirror the exact same cycle. There's a similar cycle outlined in the Buddhist Abhidharma Dharma Kosha. Um, and there's another uh, similar cycle presented in the Hindu uh, Manava Dharma Shastra. And the Jains also held a similar view. The circular view of time that history and all of the cosmos itself was in a, a circular mode, a circular cycle. Uh, was espoused by Hesiod, Pythagoras, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Heraclitus, Diogenes, Xenophanes, and Plato. And not just one circle, but many different types of circle, just as there are many different spheres of heaven oscillating and rotating. It's not just one clock. It's like spiraling many clocks, right, at once. Different types of circles, different types of times, all um, uh, morphing, you could say. Stoics would take up a cyclical, cyclical view of time. The Orphics took a circular view of time. All of these philosophers and traditions had ways of measuring the length of each age and each part of each cycle. And <clears throat> the cyclical notion of time in different guises also appeared in Mesopotamia and Egypt and other parts of the world as well. And maybe the oldest instance of cyclical time comes from, from the Rig Veda in India. Check out this quote. Formed with 12 spokes by length of time awakened, rolls round the heaven this wheel of enduring order. Herein established joins and pairs together 700 suns and 20 stand. 700 of tw and 20 is, of course, the number of days and nights in a solar year. So one day, one night, one day, one night, like that, 720 through 60 times two. So that's a beautiful quote, first of all, and it shows us right away that as old as the Rig Veda, there's, there's a conception of something very close to the Zodiac, and, and it also has this, under, this notion of something of enduring eternal uh, order that's also circular in nature. So cyclical time for us as modern people is really challenging because it really challenges all of our notions of progress. For example, one of the simplest notions of progress that we have whether it's in self-help or kind of new age speak, or even sometimes in astrology is like, um, I was bad in the past and I have to get good in the future. And being bad in the past means that I did bad things and being good in the future means I do good things, right? But this is all taking place within a linear understanding of progress. Remember that from the cyclical perspective, everything good is eventually followed by everything evil in the material sense. There are dark ages and then there are light ages and they circle and cycle like this. And so the soul similarly, if it is I trying to identify its sense of spiritual growth with material progress, well, I've become a better person. I received the Nobel Peace Prize. You know, look at how much better I got because I was selfish before or something like that. When we're trying to measure growth in terms of material results. We're, we're measuring with something that actually will eventually deteriorate. We're, the reward that we think we have will eventually be gone. The sun will burn out. The, the, you know, this universe will eventually die and be reborn again. So the, the idea that ancient astrologers were working with is that um, in order to get out of the wheel of time, we also have to stop thinking about progress in terms of time. This means that we have to, that as we are, in some ways, as we are enlightening up, let's say, we come to understand that process has less to do with what we're getting or not getting materially. You could have, you could be getting, in a sense, really bad stuff could be happening in your life, but you're growing tremendously or really good stuff could be happening in your life and you could be growing tremendously or vice versa for both, right? You, you could be um, doing really terribly, though it appears that you're doing really nice things. It's, it's spiritual 
progress, spiritual awakening is not bound to the the wheel of time and the vacillating of good and evil. It, it's, it starts to incorporate both. You want a really amazing movie that teaches us about how we change as people when we start understanding the circle of time. Check out the movie Arrival, which is a kind of cool sci-fi film that came out a few years ago. I think Rachel McAdams or Amy Adams, I can't remember her name. One of the, it's, there's an Adams in it, I think. <laughs> anyway, I think it's Amy. Uh, she's in that movie. And it's, a, it's just a fantastic movie that it, it's actually really accessible way of trying to understand what the impact of circular time might actually be on a human being. Um, so anyway, if, you're, if you want to really nerd out, check out that movie. All right. So what can we take away from this? Well, ancient astrologers believe that time was cyclical and that when we study its cycles and patterns, we can glimpse something eternal. That's why we study all of these cycles of the planets, because they remind us that everything goes round and everything goes round. And when we start recognizing that, we come into a consciousness that can perceive the whole. Our consciousness is something that is like this, all of the circle at once. And so studying these patterns and cycles and circles, we come to glimpse more of who we are because we're like Plato. He said, time is the moving image of eternity. Time, moving image of eternity. How did he see it? Cycles and circles reflected in the planets. So, <clears throat> Okay, next, this is the really juicy part. Now, there also ancient astrologers had a concern with purification, with austerities and with techniques of ecstasy. So here's some of the more specific types of things that ancient astrologers in both the East and the West did to purify their consciousness, to, um, to sort of clean or heal, as well as to enlighten up, so to speak, or awaken. Um, sometimes people think that purification, austerities, or techniques of ecstasy are only found in the East. And in the West, people were just rational thinkers. But that actually couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, for example, Plato says that once you come into contact with people who are in touch with higher truth, you start to evolve and grow. Um, that their presence it has an enlightening effect on us. Um, we see also... Um, that in both yogic and Buddhist practices, we need to have a practice of recognizing um, the, the, use, the, the phrase sometimes is neti neti, like not this, not that. Um, so for example, you're sitting and you're meditating one morning and all of a sudden you're like, you know, I'd like a fat stack of like 20 pancakes, right? If you're meditating, then you meditate and you go, hmm, okay, how would that make me feel? Would it feel good to eat 20 pancakes? Maybe, but how would I feel afterwards? I have this and this and this to do today. I'd probably end up falling asleep, passing out, having a sugar coma. Like, you know, so you start thinking about it and then you go, yeah, not worth it. I'll stick to like, you know, some healthy, whatever the healthy alternative might be. And so you, by contemplation of what will come of tasting some desire, that is unhealthy for you, you can burn up the seed of that desire before it manifests in terms of a sequence of actions. So similarly, meditation upon uh, the world and our desires can lead us to start saying, you know, not this, not that, this works, that doesn't. Starts helping us distinguish between spiritual things and purely material things, which can be, of course, very helpful. So in the Republic, Plato also describes the process of attaining knowledge um, of the higher truth in terms of love. Uh, Plato says that it's the nature of the real lover of truth to strive for this higher knowledge of oneself and of reality and eternity. Um, but as we do so, that we never lack the edge of uh, the, this love that we feel in our hearts. Like, when you pursue higher truth for Plato, like it should be in the mood of like a lover, you know, when you're really, uh, you know, you really want to be with someone and you're really crazy about them and that kind of honeymoon phase of dating or early marriage or whatever. It's like all you can think about is being with that person. Plato says we need to have the same kind of like edge of desire and eros in us when we're seeking higher truth. Bhakti yoga is the same way. This is why some of the traditions would say you need to strive for higher knowledge and truth and spiritual life with love in your heart. Uh, 
Also, Plato in the Republic talks about the lifestyle practices of an aspirant, saying that they need to have be moderate with their uh, lifestyle habits, with sleeping and with eating, and making sure that you um, feast your appetite on higher things in company with people who are interested in higher things. Otherwise, you won't sleep well. And if you don't sleep well, you won't dream well, and your dreams can be the messengers of higher truth. That's Plato. Uh, Plato also describes in the Timaeus, what what the motion of the highest state of philosophical consciousness looks like. So in other words, what does enlightenment look like? He says, so what is the nature of rational motion? That's higher. What is, the, what is basically the nature of divine reality? It's impossible to look directly at. It's like looking at the sun. That motion taking place in a single location necessarily implies continuous revolution around a central point, just like wheels being turned on a lathe. And this kind of motion bears the closest possible affinity and likeness to the cyclical movement of reason. So here you have to understand his vocabulary. He's not talking about reason in a dead boring way. What he's giving us a description of is the same kind of description that Patanjali gives in the Yoga Sutras, where he says, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, which means yoga is the stilling of the revolutions of the mind stuff. The word vritti is very similar, uh, vrit, the root of vritti, vrit, is very similar to the word ritta that we started with, that higher order, right? Vritta is like the revolutions of the sky, something revolving round and round and round and round. If we get caught up with the round and round and round and round, unhappy. If we move our consciousness into the center of the wheel or the wheel as a whole, then even though the wheel is rotating, we have identified ourselves in the unmoving center. So he, and and he says that it's that you can't describe what that unmoving center is. You can only become it, right? So you can't describe what it's like to be enlightened because to describe it is to point at something moving. To become it is to become centered despite everything continuing to move. And so um, this is this motion that he's describing is very similar to yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is the stilling of the constant revolutions of the mind. So when your mind is just going with tons of stuff, but then you learn how to find a, a central point, a point of balance or focus, absorption, then even though the stuff goes round, you're centered. You're no longer identified with the revolutions. That's why uh, also the word vritti as a, a depiction of revolution takes us back to that word ritta, the sense of cosmic truth or wholeness. So, um, and again, you have lots of other practices. The Orphics and Jains, East or West and East, believed in celibacy and took vows of poverty and only wore white, trying to control sexual energy because some, some traditions will have it that your sexual energy, if dispersed everywhere, dispersed willy-nilly, uh, is one of the easiest ways to uh, lose focus, to not be able to stay in that center place because your sexual energy is part of what allows you to stay centered. It's a, it's a part of your your constitutional strength in this body. Um, and of course, there's many similar yogic and Buddhist lineages that have the same beliefs and ideas about controlling the sexual energy. Um, but there's really extreme stuff too, like self-starvation, self-immolation, setting oneself on fire. Socrates willingly took poison in the company of his disciples' friends to demonstrate something about higher truth. Jesus died on a cross. Right? There's so many of these traditions also have the idea of like, the absorption becoming so complete that you can step right into a fire. So they can get really extreme, right? Uh, I'm not stepping into any fires anytime soon. So, um, but you get the idea. Uh, the Orphics were not only ascetic, but they also actually saw an intoxication of enthusiasm from the word entheos, which means the God within. That, that idea is that there is a potential for a union with, with divinity that can be accessed through things like music, dance, trance, and possibly entheogens, which are like psychedelics. Uh, in the Hermetica, Hermes, the philosophy of Hermes, he discusses song, poetry, meditation, and contemplation as methods of ecstasy, as well as practices of austerity, like fasting or simplicity, being really simple, not owning a lot of stuff, or of renunciation in some cases, saying no to different kinds of things. The Pythagoreans were called medical musicians. Pythagoras himself was said to be able to put both animals and human beings into a calming trance. And music could be used as a form of 
therapy to help with the soul and the different problems of karmas that we might have. So there is so, so much richness. Listen to what Empedocles wrote. You must plunge beneath your crowded thoughts and calmly contemplate the higher realities with pure focused attention. If you do this, a state of inspired serenity will main, remain with you throughout your life, shaping your character and benefiting you in so many ways. But if you direct your attention instead to the trivial things most people obsess about, the silly nonsense that dulls their minds, you'll just acquire more objects you will lose later. Okay. Like East and West, the ideas and practices are very similar. You have Tantra in the East, right? Um, but it gets better. Some of you have probably heard of the idea of uh, practices related to raising the kundalini energy. This exists in both the East and the West. There's ample evidence for the belief in something like the upward flow of kundalini energy in the East. We know that. But did you know that in the Timaeus, Plato mentions two veins that physical anatomists cannot locate, uh, which pass along the sides of the spinal column and which cross one another an unknown number of times winding around each other and uh, come up to the uh, crown of the head. Indian philosophers describe the Ida and Pangala channels in nearly the same terms. And so um, this maintenance of rising of a relation to Kundalini energy is present in both the East and the West. So there's many different practices that are being done to try to raise consciousness, actual techniques. And here's what I want to say, which is kind of maybe the, the craziest thing that I'm going to say. I don't feel like we can do real astrology. I don't feel like astrology, maybe I'll rephrase this and say, I don't think astrology can give us everything that it has to give us unless we are pairing the sacred study with actual spiritual practices and a spiritual lifestyle it means we have to be careful with putting a lot of substances into our body. We have to get a lot of sleep. We've got to drink water. We have to um, take care of our bodies, exercise, breathe, meditate, dance, journal, take walks. We, we have to find a way of getting into what some people might call flow state, which is where we find absorption in something that's creative and something that's getting us in touch with the soul. If we don't have that as a regular practice, astrology will be nothing more than a gossip column. Astrology will be nothing more than a way of pumping ourselves up about the dramas that we're embedded in, all of which we will never remember again. And really in the grand scheme of things from, from the standpoint of our ancient mystical ancestors is rather pointless, right? Like, you know, what the Kardashians are doing or what's going on in the news even, which sometimes is important, but sometimes it's just you know, it just exhausts us that uh, if astrology is not paired with getting into the flow state, uh, joining in with our uh, true self and, and, and deliberately, we have to practice to do that. It doesn't come automatically for most of us because it's so much easier to get up and just like pick up the phone and start scrolling through. It's like a little slot machine, click, 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 update, update, update. But no, we actually need something to help us connect. We need practices. All right, so what can we take from this? Ancient astrologers in both the East and the West believed in the importance of spiritual practices and a spiritual lifestyle for the sake of liberation from ignorance. And there are many, I'm not saying there's one, I'm not telling you what to do, but I think that we have to think of astrology as doing its best for us and doing its best for the world and doing its best for our clients when we pair it with a spiritual lifestyle of some kind. Um, finding that is not easy. We have to be gentle with ourselves if we're harsh or rigid, um, you know, the soul is offended if our experience of enlightenment is not beautiful. So we have to always tend to that need for beauty and uh, care as well. All right. So a few last things that I wanted to throw in. Uh, as astrologers today, these are maybe the core set of beliefs that we could say that ancient astrologers had that maybe many of us might share today, or that even that you might you could take these things that we've talked about today and basically form some basic faith statements, mission or vision statements from them as an astrologer. Someone wants to know, yeah, so what do astrologers really believe? You can be like, well, these are some of the things that we really believe. Now, if that works for you, great. If this was just historically interesting and you've got your own thing, you know, please don't, uh, you know, please don't feel like I'm trying to push anything on you in this uh, talk. Um, but if you are someone who embraces these beliefs, or even if you're just 
someone who runs into the, the people who will um, really throw some hate your way for having some spiritual beliefs in astrology or from uh, people who will just be like, astrology, that's so bogus or whatever. How do you deal with those people? And did ancient astrologers ever have to deal with that? So actually, sometimes people imagine that the ancient world was like totally mystical. Like everyone was just mystical back then. And, you know, only today do we have like, you know, haters who don't understand mysticism or something like that. Um, but this isn't true. Uh, naturalism exists in ancient times in both the East and the West. By naturalism, I mean people that believe that there is nothing more than physical material phenomenon and that it's just a, bu a bunch of, you know, chemicals and quarks and atoms and things like that that can be, you can study their laws, but there's nothing greater than that. People believe that in the ancient world as well. Um, that is, uh, there is, I'm not going to go into it, but that is a there is a philosophical presence in the ancient world that believes the exact same thing. There are also hedonists, people who say, yeah, like you go ahead and uh, restrict your intake of drugs and alcohol and, uh, you know, mind your sexual energy and stare at the stars all you want. But like, I'm going to party, right? Because, you know, I'm going to die soon and I'm, I'm here to have some fun. That also existed in the ancient world. Hedonism is nothing new. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow you will die is an old philosophy, not a new one. Um, and like even in India, people are like, well, you know, but the Indians, they're certainly, they're all holy. No, listen to the uh, Charvakas, an Indian school of materialists wrote something like this. The enjoyment of heaven consists in partaking of sweet food here and enjoying the company of damsels of 16 years of age and also in enjoying the pleasures that are derivable from the use of fine clothing, sweet scents, flower garlands, sandal, and other such things. And to them, liberation was simply, yeah, you die someday. And just enjoy it while you're here. Xenophanes was a skeptic in the West who rejected the gods and tried to stay away from any explanation about reality that departs from the world of immediate sensory observations, right? So we have today people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, love him as an astronomer, love his, you know, I love watching Cosmos and learning about the, you know, the, the greater universe. I think it's fascinating, but you know, People like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who also hate on astrology, been around for a long time. So skeptics, people who are like, mm, I think you might be doing something that's kind of crazy and nutty. And yeah, you can just, you know, stare, stare at the stars and, you know, whatever, meditate in a trance all day long. Uh, you're crazy. That's also been around for a really long time. So how do we deal with this? Well, you know, quite simply, we can just recognize that Ancient astrologers also dealt with skeptics, haters, people who didn't believe in anything other than the material world or the material body, and those who just didn't put their faith in God or divinity or the reality of the conscious soul or, the, or reincarnation or karma or enlightenment. People have had reservations, doubts, and real, even real hatred and animosity toward people who believe these things since astrology began. So knowing that, we can also know that this is part of it's natural in this world. Even Plato said, you know, we're in this cave of delusions and ignorance, seeing shadows on a wall and thinking that that's what's real, not realizing the light of the sun outside of the cave is actually what's real. But people in that cave, once you get out of the cave and you see something of a higher nature, going back in and trying to convince people that they can take off their own chains and come out and see the sun, people will try to kill you. You know, people will get pissed off. So we also have to be careful. Even in, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, you know, don't go and purposely disturb people who are just chain locked into um, delusions because um, that's a dangerous thing to do. So, you know, and, and it's not, it's not, doesn't necessarily help people when we're like that either. So at any rate, uh, we can just take some solace knowing that this, the, the, the struggle of being a spiritual person, whether in the ancient world or the modern world is, is loosely the same. Now, some other features of ancient thought that you might find interesting. Many ancient astrologers in both the East and the West were pacifists. They, were, they believed in nonviolence, and they were also vegetarians. Very interesting. Not all of them, but this was prevalent. That's something that I found really interesting. The other thing that's really interesting is you have the need to spread and share spiritual reality with others, like evangelists of any religion. Uh, astrologers were like this too. But also, um, you also have a high level of secrecy. 
initiation into astrology and the study of astrology was not for anyone. And it, it, ha it had to be taken very seriously and many of the teachings were kept very secret. So while there's some things that are being evangelized, there's also a high degree of secrecy and um, rites of passage that are also a part of spiritual life. To speak of things like the Eleusinian mysteries in, in the West, right? These are deep mysteries that people are initiated into. Um, and, uh, you know, the, a great degree of secretiveness around them, while at the same time, there's also the sort of need to go out like Socrates and speak the truth to people, right? Uh, and the same thing in the East, we have both a high degree of um, secrecy and sometimes exclusivity around the spiritual teachings um, and even around astrology. And even in India today, sometimes in order to study astrology, a guru will have you work for a year or even two years or sometimes more simply going through purification processes with mantra just to prepare yourself to be able to start studying. It, it, this was more common longer ago than it is today, but still teachers today have standards for their students. I do for my own students, right? So, um, there's same thing is happening today. We have evangelism about astrology. We have some people who represent it terribly. We have other people who do a really nice job being stewards and ambassadors to the tradition. Um, and we have people who are really eager for astrology in terms of just selfishness. Ancient world was no different. People were interested in astrology for very selfish reasons at times. But the underlying belief of why we do astrology, um, it, it's because we are spiritual beings and yet we're in material bodies. We're a part of a, a larger cosmos that has harmony, but sometimes we have to tune our instruments to make sure we stay in tune. There's a spiritual journey that's going on here of awakening and astrology is part of a, to is a tool that helps us do that. So finally, last thing I'm gonna touch on is diffusion channels. People wanna know sometimes, so did all of this come from India to the West or did it, trans did it migrate from the West to the East? And there are endless debates about that. So my answer is, not going to touch it. If you want to read a really interesting book about it, uh, The Interactions of Ancient Astral Science. It's a very thick volume that really goes into detail about how, how much blending and mixing there was from East and West around um, both astronomy and astrology. But just so you know, uh, I just, I just didn't, I decided not to go there in this talk because it's also just like, it's really super heady and academic. And this has already been a pretty dense like historical and philosophical talk. So I hope that today you've gotten something in this talk about the spiritual roots of astrology, that this may help you clarify or just better understand your spiritual heritage as someone who's passionate about astrology. Um, and that it may also um, help, if nothing else, just help you clarify for yourself that, um, you know, the things that we struggle with today, the things that we have questions about today, the things that we're doing today um, with astrology have been done for a really long time. Um, so if you're interested in um, any of the work that I'm doing, here are some ways that you can stay in touch with me. And I'm, again, so thankful to Nadia for having me on her um, program again. I'm, I'm really thankful to be here, and I hope that this held your attention was interesting. So I teach a one-year course in ancient astrology. It is not a course in history and it's not a course in philosophy. It does include some of both, but it is a course in how to read natal charts, how to read birth charts from the standpoint of Hellenistic astrology, which is the sort of old ancient astrology. It's very similar to Indian astrology. It's a really fun, beautiful course. It's called Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic. I try to make ancient astrology really accessible for people like you and I who are living in the modern age. So it's a one-year course. It meets over the course of a whole year together. We meet on Saturdays from noon to 2.30 p.m. Eastern time via live webinars, but you don't have to be there live to participate. You can participate remotely and follow along at your own pace if you want. Um, it starts on November 16th this year, and um, there is an early bird rate that is available if you pay in full before the November 1st uh, deadline. You can check all of that out on my website at nightlightastrology.com. Um, also, if you are interested in um, the evolutionary growth of the soul and the study of karma in ancient astrology, I'm also offering a three-part seminar series in January called The Evolution of the Soul from the Perspective of Ancient Astrology. And this is a course on how the nodes of the moon were used by Hellenistic and Indian astrologers and how we can understand 
the traditional use of the nodes in relation to karma and the soul because it's actually in some ways it's really really different from the some of the current things that you might hear uh, from like evolutionary astrology which is like a, a modern form of astrology that pays a lot of attention to the nodes of the moon so this is uh, another series that might be interesting you interesting to you you can check it out on the events page of my website. And again, that's at nightlightastrology.com. I also offer private apprenticeships and you can see my readings and I write daily columns, horoscopes, and I have a YouTube channel you can check out at Adam Ellen Boss. So thank you guys for listening. I hope that this was, um, I hope that this was really interesting for you. I hope you took a lot from it. If you have any questions about this presentation, feel free to email me. My email address is nightlightastrology at gmail.com. So again, a big shout out and thanks to Nadia for having me. I hope all of you have a fantastic end to your 2019. Take care.